Welcome back. In the last few lectures, we discussed uh, compression refrigeration systems. So, in this lecture, I shall introduce another very important refrigeration system known as vapor absorption refrigeration system. So, the specific objectives of this particular lesson are to introduce basic concepts of vapor absorption refrigeration systems, introduce simple vapor absorption refrigeration system, derive expression for maximum COP, discuss properties of ideal and real solutions. Describe a basic uh, vapor absorption refrigeration system with solution heat exchanger and finally, uh, discuss desirable properties of refrigerant absorbent mixers. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain basic principles of absorption refrigeration systems, estimate maximum COP of absorption refrigeration systems, differentiate between ideal and real solutions, describe the basic absorption refrigeration system with solution heat exchanger. And finally, list desirable properties of refrigerant absorbent pairs. Let me give, give a brief introduction. Uh, vapor absorption refrigerant systems belong to the class of vapor cycle similar to vapor compression refrigerant systems. Okay, that means they are uh, just like vapor compression system, these are also vapor cycles. That means as I have already explained, the working fluid undergoes a phase change during the cycle. So, they are uh, vapor cycles like compression systems, but there is one major difference between absorption systems and compression systems. What is the difference? Unlike uh, vapor compression refrigerant systems, the required input to absorption systems is mainly in the form of low grade thermal energy. If you remember in the compression systems, the major input uh, or the input to the system is in the form of mechanical energy to run the compressor. Okay, so, that is uh, you can call that as a work operated system, whereas in absorption refrigerant systems, the main input to the system is in the form of low grade thermal energy or heat. That is why these systems are also known as heat operated systems or the thermal energy driven systems. Okay, this is the major difference between compression systems and absorption systems. These uh, absorption systems are also widely used in various refrigeration and air conditioning applications. Since absorption refrigerant systems run on low grade thermal energy, they are preferred when low grade energy such as waste heat or solar energy is available. There are many industries and many situations where uh, plenty of uh, low grade uh, thermal energy is either uh, rejected, it is not used properly. Okay. In such circumstances, uh, one can use vapor absorption refrigerant systems by tapping the low grade thermal energy. The typical example is the waste heat rejected in uh, many of the process plants, etc. Or you can also use other low grade energy sources such as solar energy to drive the vapor absorption system. This is one of the main uh, applications and advantages of uh, absorption systems compared to compression system. That means, you can use low grade uh, energy sources. Okay. And since uh, the working fluids used in absorption systems are uh, mainly natural working fluids, that means you use either water or ammonia, which are uh, natural refrigerants, these systems are uh, environment friendly. Okay. These are uh, two uh, most important advantages of absorption systems compared to vapor compression refrigerant systems. So, as I said, since conventional absorption systems use natural refrigerants such as water or ammonia, they are environment friendly. Now, let us look at some basic concepts. The first uh, basic concept is that when a solute for example, such as a lithium bromide salt is dissolved in a solvent uh, for example, water, the boiling point of the solution is elevated. Okay. This, uh, this you can also state in another uh, way, uh, for example, if you are keeping the temperature constant and if you are dissolving the solute in a solvent, then the effect of this uh, dissolving is to reduce the vapor pressure of the solvent below that of its saturation pressure at that temperature. So, this is the basic concept based on which the absorption systems have been built. Okay. So, now let us look at uh, the most uh, basic uh, absorption system. Uh, in a basic absorption system, refrigeration is obtained by connecting two vessels with one vessel containing pure solvent. So, we call it as refrigerant and the other containing a solution which is a mixture of refrigerant plus absorbent. At equilibrium, the temperature of the solution will be higher than that of the pure refrigerant. When the pressures are same, obviously as I have mentioned already, the temperature of the solution will be higher than that of the uh, so, so pure solvent. And if the solution is at ambient temperature, obviously the solvent that means the refrigerant will be at a temperature lower than the ambient. That means there is a temperature difference between the ambient and the solvent. 
So, this is the temperature difference using which you can produce a refrigeration effect. So, this is the basic principle. Now, let me explain this uh, with this schematic. What I uh, what I have shown here, uh, let us look at the initial conditions. Initially, we have two vessels A and uh, vessel B. Uh, vessel A consists of pure water at 30 degree centigrade and vessel B consists of a solution of water and lithium bromide 50 percent lithium bromide by mass. Okay. So, one is a pure solvent that is water, the other one is a mixture of water and lithium bromide salt. Uh, let us say that initially the valve is closed and the entire system is in thermal equilibrium with the surroundings which is at 30 degree centigrade. So, everywhere you have 30 degree centigrade in vessel B as well as vessel A and vessel A and B are isolated. Okay. So, now what is the vapor pressure in vessel A and what is the vapor pressure in vessel B? If you look at the steam tables or uh, steam charts, you will find that at 30 degree centigrade, the saturation uh, pressure of water is 4.24 kilo Pascal. That means, the pressure inside the vessel A, that means this side of the system is 4.24 kilo Pascal, which is nothing but the saturation uh, pressure of water at 30 degree centigrade. Now, what is the pressure on uh, in vessel B? Since in vessel B we have we do not have pure water, but we have a solution obviously at the same temperature there will be a lower vapor pressure. And if you look at the properties of lithium bromide water solution, you will find that at 50 percent concentration and at 30 degree centigrade the pressure here is 1.22 kilo Pascal. These are the pressures at equilibrium conditions. Now, you can maintain the pressures at different values because the valve is closed. Now, let us say that we have opened the valve. Okay, come to uh, this uh, second part, we open the valve. Initially what happens because of the pressure difference, the vapor flows from this side to this side and since this solution, lithium bromide water solution has an affinity for wa water vapor, uh, the water vapor gets absorbed here. Okay, that means the water vapor is absorbed here and the pressure try to be, tries to be same in both the vessels. Okay, so, everywhere you have the uh, uniform pressure. Now, suppose uh, by some means we are able to maintain the concentration and temperature in vessel B. Okay. Uh, let us uh, discuss how we can do this at a little later, but uh, for, for the time being assume that we are able to maintain the composition and temperature. Then what will be the pressure in the entire system? The pressure in the entire system will be 1.22 kilo Pascal, which is decided by the solution and this is nothing but the equilibrium uh, vapor pressure at this composition and this temperature. So, on this side also you have 1.22 kilo Pascal. Okay. If you have 1.22 kilo Pascal here, what will be the water temperature? So, again if you look at the steam tables or charts, you will find that at 1.22 kilo Pascal, this temperature at equilibrium is nothing but the saturation temperature corresponding to this pressure. That means, you will have 10 degree centigrade temperature in the vessel A. Okay, that means, by having this combination and by opening the valve, I could reduce the temperature from 30 degrees to 10 degrees centigrade. Okay. And as long as you can maintain the conditions in B, the conditions in A can be maintained at 1.22 kilo Pascal and 10 degree centigrade. Now, the outside temperature is 30 degree centigrade and the water is uh, at 10 degree centigrade and let us assume that we do not have, uh, we have diathermic valves that means, heat can be transferred from outside to the water. So, there is heat transfer from the surroundings to the water and as a result of the heat transfer, the water will evaporate. Okay. And this vapor continuously flows from uh, vessel A to vessel B where it gets absorbed. Now, the absorption process is an exothermic process in this case. So, heat is released and since we want to maintain the temperature at 30 degree centigrade, this heat has got to be continuously rejected to the surroundings. That means, during this step what we are doing is we are adding heat at vessel A and we are rejecting heat at vessel B. And you, you are able to produce refrigeration effect here because you are able to transfer heat from the surroundings to a body at 10 degree centigrade. Okay, that is how you are getting a refrigeration effect here. Now, if you have a finite uh, sized vessels, let us say that means A and B are finite sized, then you have a finite amount of water in vessel A and finite amount of solution in vessel B. And as a result of this uh, water vapor transfer from vessel A to B, at, at a point, a point may come where vessel A may become empty or this may become saturated. Okay. That means, uh, once it this becomes, uh, take the first uh, case, uh, the, when this beca vessel be becomes empty, empty means empty of liquid, then there will not be any more uh, heat transfer because nothing can evaporate. Okay. So, the refrigeration effect stops here. 
Okay. That means, uh, by this means whatever refrigeration effect you are able to pr produce that is intermittent and it will stop after some point when you are using finite vessels. Okay. So, this is the, so what, do, what we have to do to continue this process, to continue this process what we have to do is we have to bring back this system to its original position. Okay. So, how do we do that? We do that by regenerating the water vapor. Okay. So, let us uh, see what is the regeneration process. Okay, so, this is uh, this picture here shows the process of regeneration. During the regeneration process what we do is initially we keep the valve closed and bring the vessels A and B, vessel A and B again to equilibrium with the surroundings. So, again everything will be at 30 degree centigrade. Now, open the vessel, uh, open the valve and supply heat to vessel B. Okay. Now, this uh, due to the uh, vapor transfer in the previous step, uh, this solution is weak. That means, it has more water vapor. Okay, so, when you are supplying heat at a particular temperature T g, okay, when you are supplying uh, heat then water is generated at this point and this water vapor uh, flows from this side to this side and if you are able to keep this at 30 degree centigrade then the water water vapor is coming here, it will condense uh, at this pressure and at this temperature. Since this is a, an exothermic process, heat of condensation is rejected to the surroundings. Okay. That means, during the regeneration process what we are doing? We are supplying heat at a high temperature Tg to the solution, so that vapor is generated and this vapor comes to the solvent side and it condenses by rejecting heat of condensation. Okay. So, uh, you are transferring the, you are reversing the process and you are transferring water from the solution to the uh, pure solvent side. Okay. This process will continue till you get the required amount of water on this side. Okay. Then to complete the process again you have to close the valve and bring these both the vessels to equilibrium with the surroundings at 30 degree centigrade. So, the process continues. Okay. So, one thing you can notice here is we have the three temperatures here. One is the Tg which is nothing but the temperature at which heat is supplied to the solution for regeneration. Okay. Let us call that as generator temperature Tg okay. and we have another temperature called the heat sink temperature that means the temperature at which heat is rejected during absorption process and during the condensation process okay, T0 and finally, we have uh, the refrigeration temperature Te. Okay. This is the temperature at which refrigeration is produced. Obviously, Tg is greater than T0 is greater than Te. Okay. This, uh, uh, relation holds good. And now, how do we decide the uh, what should be this temperature and how much heat has to be supplied and all? That depends upon the uh, the temperatures for example, the amounts of heat transferred. These dep they depend upon the properties of solution and the refrigerant and also the operating conditions. Okay. So, this is the basic uh, principle of uh, a very simple uh, vapor absorption refrigerant system. Okay. So, to summarize what we have done is we have taken two vessels in one, one vessel we have kept pure solvent and the other vessel we have a solution. Okay. So, by manipul manipulating the pressures inside by supplying heat or by rejecting heat, we could transfer vapor from the pure uh, refrigerant side to the solution side during the refrigeration process and from the solution side to the refri refrigerant side during the regeneration process. Okay. And uh, during this uh, uh, entire process, we could get uh, refrigeration effect during one step and we have to supply uh, heat at high temperature during the regeneration process and heat is rejected um, in both the processes of refrigeration and regeneration. Okay. So, this is an intermittent system that means you are not able to get refrigeration continuously. Okay. So, you call this as an intermittent absorption refrigeration system. Okay. Okay. So, as I said, there you call this as an intermittent system. So, with only two vessels, the refrigeration obtained is intermittent. So, no refrigeration effect is produced during vapor regeneration. And these uh, simple systems also have uh, some applications. They can be used to provide refrigeration using renewable energy such as solar energy. For example, you would like to produce refrigeration using solar energy. Okay. So, you can have a very, very simple uh, intermittent system consisting of these simple two, uh, two vessels and we with a valve and connections. Okay. What you have to do is during the daytime when solar energy is available, refrigerant is generated okay, and it is stored as pure refrigerant. Okay. During the daytime, the, uh, the, it is the process of regeneration and during night time what happens is surroundings become cool. Okay, then the process gets reversed because, because the solution becomes cool. So, the refrigerant in the vessel, pure uh, refrigerant vessel can boil by taking heat from the surroundings. Okay, that means, you get refrigeration effect during the night 
and you have to regenerate the refrigerant during the daytime. Such systems are very, very uh, good for uh, very remote and rural areas where uh, you do not have any electrical electricity supply or you want a system which is independent of your grid power. Okay. Such systems have been built and they, are, they have been used quite successfully in many remote areas. Okay. So, they are known as intermittent absorption refrigeration systems. But in practice, uh, in most of the applications, we require a continuous refrigeration. Okay. When, when you want a refrigeration continuously, obviously you cannot use this simple system with two vessels. So, you have to do certain modifications. So, this brings us to a basic vapor absorption refrigeration system for continuous output. So, continuous refrigeration can be obtained with a modified system consisting of two pairs of vessels and additional components such as expansion valves and solution pump. So, you have to have first thing is two pairs of vessel that means you will have four vessels. In addition to that you also have to have some additional components such as expansion valves and a solution pump. These systems are similar to compression systems uh, that means uh, you get uh, continuous output just like a vapor compression system, but there are uh, two uh, major differences. The major difference is uh, the way uh, the vapor is compressed. In a mechanical, uh, it is mechanical compression in vapor compression refrigeration system that means you use mechanical energy, supply the mechanical energy to the compressor and compress the vapor mechanically. Okay. So, you call uh, these systems are mechanical compression systems. Okay. And uh, in case of absorption systems, you can call that as thermal compression. Okay. If you compress the vapor thermally. Now, let me explain uh, the basic system. Okay, so, here you have uh, the basic vapor absorption refrigerant system. So, you have uh, a condenser, an expansion device and an evaporator just like a vapor compression system. The only difference between uh, vapor compression system and vapor absorption system lies in the way in which you have compressed the vapor from the evaporator. That means, what happens from this point onwards. Okay. So, in vapor compression system what is done? This low pressure, low temperature vapor is compressed mechanically. Okay mechanically it is compressed to high pressure, so that it can reject heat in the condenser to the external heat sink and it can uh, condense and become a liquid. Okay. So, you call this system as I said as a mechanical compression system, whereas you can see that in vapor absorption system you do not have a compressor. Okay. In place of a single component compressor you have four components, one is generator, absorber, expansion device and a solution pump. Okay. So, the combination of uh, uh, these four components replace the compressor of a vapor compression system. Okay. So, now let me explain the working principle. Let us start again from uh, the point at the outlet of the evaporator. We have low temperature, low pressure vapor at this point. Okay. It goes to the absorber. In the absorber, this uh, vapor, refrigerant vapor comes in contact with uh, the solution that is coming from the generator that means this solution which is weaker in refrigerant. Okay. This is weak in refrigerant. When this solution is weak in refrigerant, it has the uh, potential to absorb the uh, refrigerant vapor. Okay. So, when this uh, refrigerant vapor comes in contact with this uh, weak solution, then uh, the vapor gets absorbed. Okay. Since the absorption process is an exothermic uh, process, heat is re rejected uh, to the atmosphere at temperature T naught and this is the amount of heat rejected during this process. Okay. So, the weak solution and refrigerant vapor are combining, heat is rejected. So, as a result of this uh, mixing, what you have uh, is a rich solution. Okay. This solution is a rich solution rich solution means rich in refrigerant. Now, this rich solution is pumped to the condenser pressure using a solution pump. Okay. A solution pump is used to compress the uh, vapor from the absorber uh, from the, the compressor uh, liquid from the absorber to the condenser pressure. Okay. And uh, now, at this point you have high pressure liquid. Now, this high pressure liquid goes to the generator. In the generator what is done is heat is supplied at high temperature. Okay. So, when you supply heat at high temperature to the rich solution, refrigerant vapor is generated. Okay. So, this refrigerant vapor at high pressure and high temperature goes to the condenser where it rejects heat to the surroundings, condenses and becomes a liquid. Okay. And this liquid uh, again expands in the expansion device. So, you have here a low quality liquid vapor 
uh, mixer at low, uh, low temperature and low pressure. This enters into the evaporator, it takes heat from the surroundings, produces the refrigeration effect and becomes the vapor again. So, that is how the vapor cycle is completed. Okay. So, the only difference you can notice here is uh, instead of compressing it mechanically, we have compressed it um, thermally. Okay. Now, what happens to the solution? Here remember that we had a rich solution that is entering into the generator. So, from that you have stripped off the refrigerant. So, what you have is a weak solution. Okay. Now, this weak solution is still at high pressure. Okay. So, to complete the cycle for the solution, you have to reduce its um, pressure. So, we use a, an expansion device where the uh, liquid pressure is reduced to that of the uh, absorber uh, or evaporator okay. and uh, then again it comes in contact with this vapor. So, the uh, solution cycle is also completed. So, this process goes on continuously as long as you supply heat here, you reject heat uh, at absorber and condenser and you have refrigeration effect continuously. Okay. So, this is the principle of uh, a very basic vapor uh, absorption refrigeration system. Mm -hmm. And as I said, uh, you can feel uh, the similarities just like vapor compression system, you have two pressure levels here, PC and PE here, PC and PE here. Okay. However, unlike vapor uh, compression system, there are two, three temperatures here. In vapor compression system, we have only two temperatures that is this is the T naught is the heat sink temperature and, and TE is the low temperature. Heat, low heat source, heat source temperature. Okay. Whereas, in absorption system, we have three temperatures. One is T e that is the low, low temperature source, uh, low source. Uh, then T naught is the heat sink temperature and T z is the high temperature uh, heat source okay, at where from which you supply the heat to the generator. So, this is a three temperature cycle and vapor compression reference system is a two temperature cycle. Okay. So, the major difference is uh, you have seen. Now, what is the advantage of this? I mean you, um, uh, if you look at uh, the components and the schematic, you will find that the vapor absorption system is a uh, lot more complicated uh, compared to vapor compression system. We had only 4 components in vapor compression system whereas, we had 7 components in vapor absorption systems. Okay. And uh, you might have noticed that even though we did not use a compressor, we still used a pump in the vapor absorption system. Now, the pump requires mechanical energy. Okay. So, both vapor absorption systems as well as vapor compression systems both need the uh, mechanical energy, one to run the compressor and the in other case you need it for running the pump. Okay. And in addition to that, you also have to supply heat at high temperature. Okay. Since uh, mechanical energy is required in both the cases, what is the advantage of absorption system compared to compression system? Sir? The advantage is like this. Sir. In the compression system, you are compressing a vapor. Okay, so, the mechanical energy required to compress a vapor is quite large. Whereas, in vapor absorption system, you are pumping a liquid and the work required to pump a liquid for the over the same pressure difference is much less compared to the work required for compressing a vapor. Okay, this is the major difference. That means, the amount of mechanical energy required in vapor absorption systems is very, very small compared to a vapor compression refrigeration system. Okay. In fact, it is practically negligible when you compare it with the heat input. So, that is why absorption systems are mainly called as uh, heat operated system because that is the major heat input is major input is in the form of heat. Okay. Uh, why do, how do we say that uh, the energy required uh, for com compressing a vapor is much higher than uh, the energy required for pumping a liquid because you have seen that the work input is simply equal to integral Vdp. Uh, and uh, the V is nothing but the specific volume uh, of the working fluid. In one case, you have a vapor which has a very high specific volume. Uh, that is why integral Vdp is very high. Whereas, in absorption system, you have a liquid with very small specific volume. So, integral Vdp is very small. So, the mechanical energy requirement is very small. Okay. So, this is the major difference and major advantage of absorption systems over compression systems. Okay. So, that is what I have uh, mentioned here, work input required to pump uh, liquid solution is much less than the work required for compressing vapor. So, the mechanical energy required to operate absorption systems is much less than that required to operate a compression system. However, uh, of course, you have to pay somewhere. So, uh, what do you do? In, uh, instead of a com uh, mechanical energy, you have to supply a large amount of low grade thermal energy to operate the absorption system. And as I said, the solution pump work is often negligible compared to the generator heat input. 
So, if you are uh, defining COPs just like the compression system, you can see that the COP of a compression system is defined as the refrigeration uh, capacity divided by the power input of the compressor Wc, whereas the COP of vapor absorption system you have two, two inputs and one output, output is Qe, input is the heat input uh, Qz plus uh, work input Wp. And as I have said, Wp is negligible compared to Qz. So, COP of absorption refrigeration system is almost equal to Qe by Qz only. That means, uh, refrigeration capacity divided by the heat input to the generator. Okay. So, this is the major difference between again compression and absorption systems in terms of COPs. Since uh, vapor absorption refrigeration system uses uh, low grade energy as input, the COP of uh, absorption system is generally much smaller than COP of compression refrigeration system. Obviously, uh, if you are uh, uh, I mean, if you are comparing the COPs, uh, you get much higher COPs in case of uh, compression systems, uh, okay, because the quality of the energy that you are supplying to the system is much higher, uh, okay, work is a uh, high grade energy compared to heat, okay, so the COPs are uh, larger, uh, okay. But of course, uh, comparing the systems based on uh, COPs, you can call also call the COP as the first law efficiency. Uh, comparing the efficiencies based on COPs is not really justified always because the quality is different and the cost is also different. Okay. That means, uh, comparing systems based on COPs is not fully justified as mechanical energy is more expensive than thermal energy. Hence, sometimes uh, what we do is we define what is known as a second law or exergetic efficiency to compare different refrigeration systems. And you will find that the second law efficiency of absorption system is of the same order as that of a compression system. Okay, that means, if you are comparing the uh, two systems based on COPs, uh, then absorption system is definitely uh, bad because you get very low COP. But as I said, uh, since the uh, numerator and denominator are of different qualities, uh, if you want to get the real picture, you must convert them into the same quantity. Okay, that means, you have to convert uh, the numerator and denominator in the expression for COP into exergy let us say, then you get what is known as second law efficiency or exergetic efficiency. When you are doing this, you will find that the COP of absorption, uh, I am sorry, the exergetic efficiency of absorption system is almost same as that of a compression system. Okay. So, it does not look so bad when you are looking at the exergetic um, efficiency. Okay. Uh, this uh, you can also justify this in an another way. For example, when you are uh, talking about the COP of a compression system, uh, what is the input? Input is the work uh, mechanical energy. Okay, most of the times the mechanical energy is uh, derived from the electrical energy. That means you to run a compressor, you, su you supply the electrical energy. Okay, and how do you get the electrical energy? Electrical energy is generated, let us say, in a thermal power plant. Okay, and typical efficiency of a thermal power plant could be about 40 percent. You are not really compare, taking that efficiency into account when you are calculating the COP of the vapor compression system. Okay, if you take that efficiency also into account, you will find that uh, the compression systems are not um, so efficient compared to uh, vapor absorption systems. Or in other words, both are equally good or bad. Okay. Now, uh, when we discuss vapor compression refrigeration systems. Uh, how, if you remember, how did we begin? We began with a, an ideal cycle. Okay. First, we have defined an ideal cycle and we found what is the maximum possible COP uh, of this uh, cycle. That means, uh, we, uh, we found uh, we, uh, the maximum possible COP of a compression system. Okay. And if you remember, uh, it, it was the Kano COP. Okay. That means, uh, the reverse Kano cycle gives the maximum uh, COP. So, first we obtained the expression for uh, the COP of uh, reverse Kano cycle and then we obtain the expression for the uh, COPs for the real cycles. Okay. Uh, and if you remember, I said that the objective of this is to compare how good is the actual cycle with the best possible or with the ideal cycle. Okay. So, in case of absorption systems also, let us first look at uh, what is the maximum possible COP. Okay. Uh, then we will move on to the actual systems. So, as I said for compression refrigeration system, the maximum COP is given by Kano COP and Kano COP if you remember is simply given by T e divided by T c minus T e, where T e and T c are evaporator and condenser temperatures. However, in uh, simple absorption refrigeration system, we have three temperatures. So, when you have three temperature levels, how do you get the uh, maximum COP? Okay. Um, one thing is uh, for sure that uh, the COP will be maximum when the system is totally reversible. That means, when you have an ideal vapor absorption refrigeration system, where uh, it is uh, reversible internally as well as externally. Okay, that means, a totally reversible system. 
So, the COP of ideal vapor absorption reduction system can be obtained by applying first and second laws of thermodynamics. Okay. So, what we do is we take a ideal system and then you apply the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Let me show how we can do this. Okay, what I have shown here is the basic vapor absorption reduction system. This is the absorption reduction system which is operating in a cyclic manner. Okay, you can see the cycle. And here we have uh, three temperatures as I said, generator temperature, evaporator temperature and the heat sink temperature. And uh, this figure also shows various energy uh, flows. Okay. For example, uh, you take uh, high temperature heat input QZ to the system uh, near the generator and uh, this system takes low temperature heat input QE at refrigeration temperature TE and it rejects heat to the heat sink and heat rejection takes place at the absorber Q A plus condenser Q C. Okay. So, heat rejected is Q A plus Q C whereas, heat input is Q Z and Q E. Q Z is at the generator and Q E is at the evaporator. In addition to that, we also supply uh, mechanical energy to run the pump okay, W P. So, these are the total uh, energy flows in a simple vapor absorption reference system. So, if you apply a first law of thermodynamics, what is the first law of thermodynamics? If you remember, simply we have Okay. And for the cycle, uh, the net energy change is 0 because the working fluid is undergoing a cyclic process. Okay. So, what is the energy change, uh, uh, cyclic energy change? You can simply write this uh, as Q e plus Q z minus Q c plus a, Q c plus a is nothing but Q c plus Q a okay. plus W p is 0, this is nothing but this expression. Where uh, as I said, uh, Q e and Q z are positive because you are supplying them to the system this is negative because this is the heat rejected from the system and uh, mega work input required for the pump is also positive because that is also supplied. Okay. So, whatever is supplied to the system is positive and whatever is rejected from the system is negative. Okay. So, this is how you get the first law of thermodynamics, very simple energy balance. Now, what is the second law of thermodynamics? We write the second law of thermodynamics in uh, the form of entropy change. And if you remember the second law of thermodynamics says that the total entropy change, that means the entropy change of the system plus surroundings will always be greater than or equal to 0 and this equal sign is for completely reversible uh, if everything is uh, reversible and the greater than is for irreversible uh, systems. Okay. So, this is the second law of thermodynamics. right? Now, let us write uh, expressions for uh, delta surroundings in terms of Q e, Q z and Q c. Now, what is the entropy change of the system? Obviously, entropy change of the system is 0. right? So, delta S system is 0 because the working fluid is undergoing a cyclic process. Okay, so, delta S uh, system is 0. right? That means, uh, ultimately the second law of thermodynamics uh, when you apply to this uh, simply becomes delta S total is equal to delta S surrounding which is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. Now, uh, as I said, uh, delta F system is 0 because the system undergoes a cyclic process. Okay. Now, we write uh, the expression for delta S uh, surroundings. Surroundings means we have three temperature uh, reservoirs. One is the low temperature reservoir at T e, the other one is at high temperature reservoir at T z and this is the medium temperature heat sink at T naught. Okay. And what is the entropy change of uh, these reservoirs? The entropy change of uh, low temperature reservoir is this minus Q e by T e minus because the reservoir is losing heat okay, and the its temperature is constant. Okay. So, delta S if you remember is uh, dou Q by T because you are uh, uh, the reservoir is undergoing a reversible temperature change. So, you can write this and uh, T is constant. So, simply this becomes uh, 1 Q 2 or whatever it is delta Q divided by the particular temperature. So, when you are applying this to the evaporator, this becomes minus Q e by T e. When you apply this to the generator, this becomes minus Q g by T z. And when you are applying this to the heat sink, this becomes plus because heat sink is taking the energy and uh, this energy is taken at temperature T naught. Okay. So, this is the expression for the entropy change of the surroundings. Okay. Now, you combine the first and second laws, so you get this expression. Okay. Uh, this expression relates the Q z and Q e. What we are doing is we are eliminating Q a plus c by using the first law. Okay, so, you that is eliminated and then you end up get this expression. Now, if you are neglecting pump work, okay, that means you are neglecting pump work and if you de define C O P as we have seen, 
COP is equal to QE divided by QZ. Okay. You will find that from this expression, COP of a vapor absorption deflection system is given by this expression. Okay. That means always less than or equal to TE divided by T naught minus TE into Tg minus T naught by Tz, where remember that Tg is the generator temperature which is the highest uh, temperature in the cycle, uh, T naught is the heat sink temperature and T is the lowest temperature of the evaporator. Okay. Now, for a totally because uh, we started this uh, discussion of, uh, with a view to find out the maximum COP. Okay. So, as I said maximum COP uh, takes place when the system is ideal okay. and for an ideal system entropy change is 0. Okay. Entropy change of system is 0 for both ideal as well as real system because it is a cyclic process. So, for an ideal system in addition to this, this also should be 0. Okay. That means delta S surroundings for a completely reversible system is equal to 0. So, if you are equating uh, this from the earlier expression, you will get this expression. Okay. From this expression, you get the uh, COP for an ideal system. This is the maximum possible COP of okay, of any vapor absorption deflection system operating between 3 temperatures T e, T naught and T g. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, this expression, you will uh, notice an interesting thing. For example, you take a look at this quantity okay, and uh, look at this quantity. This quantity for example, looks like the Kano COP of a vapor compression system. Okay. Uh, because if you remember uh, Kano COP is simply given by T e divided by T, uh, T c minus T e, where T c is equal to T naught in this case. So, this uh, particular quantity is nothing but the COP of a Kano system. And what is this quantity? This quantity is nothing but the efficiency of a Kano heat engine. Okay. So, the ultimately the COP of an ideal vapor absorption system is shown to be a product of Kano COP into Kano heat engine. Okay. That means, you can uh, show uh, an ideal va vapor absorption system as a combination of Kano heat engine and Kano refrigerator. Okay. So, what you are doing is this is the generator, okay. you supply Q z from the generator to a Kano heat engine and uh, produce work and uh, reject uh, some heat to the surroundings and this work is used to run a Kano refrigerator. Okay, so, the same work is applied to run a Kano refrigerator and this refrigerator takes heat from the low temperature surroundings Q e and again it rejects the heat to the heat sink T naught and the efficiency of this so heat engine is nothing but T g minus T T naught by T g and C O P of this Kano cycle is uh, if you remember T e divided by T naught minus T e. So, the combined efficiency of this uh, N combined is nothing but the efficiency of this multiplied by the efficiency of this that is N e into C O P R. Okay. So, that is how you can split a 3 temperature reference system as a combination of 2 2 temperature systems. So, you can see that, uh, so now from this you can uh, easily uh, infer that the COP of an ideal vapor absorption system increases as evaporator temperature increases, as generator temperature increases and heat sink temperature decreases. When uh, generator temperature increases and uh, heat sink temperature decreases, the heat engine efficiency increases. Okay. And similarly, when the evaporator temperature increases and the condenser temperature uh, reduces, the COP of the Kano refrigeration cycle increases. So, as a result of which, uh, the combined efficiency improves. Okay, so, if you want to have a very high COP of a vapor absorption refrigeration system, an ideal system, you have to operate the system at as high a generator temperature as possible, as high an evaporator temperature as possible and as low a heat sink temperature as possible. Okay. However, uh, you will find that the COP of actual systems will be much smaller than the ideal COP due to various internal and external irreversibilities. So, as usual you will find that all real systems. Uh, will give COPs which are much smaller than the ideal system COP. Okay. This is mainly because of the uh, river, uh, irreversibilities. Remember that an ideal the difference between ideal and uh, real cycle is lies in the irreversibilities. Okay. So, in the real cycle you have irreversibilities both internal as well as external. Okay. For example, what are the internal irreversibilities? Internal irre irreversibilities could be uh, pressure drop due to friction, it could be in this case uh, 
uh, irreversibility due to mixing right and uh, the external irreversibilities are uh, irreversibility due to temperature difference uh, between the working fluid and the external heat sink or source okay so major mainly the temperature differences these are the different uh, irreversibilities which are a must in a real system okay so as a result the real system cop will be much less than the ideal vapor absorbing different system cop okay now let us look at properties of refrigerant absorbent mixers uh, the solution used in absorption different systems may be considered as a homogeneous binary mixer of refrigerant and absorbent okay you have noticed that in the thermal compression part of the vapor absorption system we have a solution okay a solution circulates through the components and this so what is the solution this solution is nothing but a mixer of refrigerant and absorbent and for simplicity we assume that it's a binary mixer and it's a homogeneous mixer okay now depending upon the boiling point difference between the refrigerant and absorbent and the operating temperatures one may encounter a pure refrigerant vapor or a mixture of refrigerant and absorbent vapor in generator of the absorption system okay that means while uh, ex uh, discussing the or describing the simple vapor absorption different system i mentioned that in the generator you supply heat at high temperature and refrigerant vapor is generated okay and that refrigerant vapor goes to the condenser it gets condensed and all that but in actual uh, systems depending upon the boiling point uh, temperature difference between the refrigerant and absorbent in addition to the refrigerant vapor you may also have some vapor of the absorbent in the generator okay that means when you are supplying heat to the generator both refrigerant as well as absorbent may boil okay that means what goes to the condenser may not be pure refrigerant but a mixture of refrigerant and absorbent vapors okay whether you have a mixer or a pure refrigerant dep purely depends upon the boiling point temperature difference between uh, the refrigerant and absorbent if you have a very high boiling point temperature difference that means when the absorbent is non volatile then you will find that uh, whatever is generated in the generator is uh, pure refrigerant okay on the other hand if the temperature difference is not too high that means absorbent is also volatile then both will be generated in the generator okay an example of the first case where you have a non volatile uh, absorbent is uh, when you use uh, water and lithium bromide okay so where lithium bromide is absorbent it is non volatile so pure water vapor is generated whereas if you use ammonia water systems where water is absorbent uh, and ammonia is a refrigerant both water and uh, ammonia may be generated in the generator okay so this is the difference between uh, different refrigerant absorbent pairs okay now properties of binary solutions are evaluated from pressure temperature composition data so if you want to find the properties you have to specify pressure temperature and composition composition of the solution can be expressed either in mass fraction or in mole fraction okay so what is mass fraction mole fraction so mass fraction is uh, defined as uh, okay mass fraction is also sometimes called as concentration concentration of component 1 so i1 is simply defined as a mass of uh, that particular component divided by the total mass of the solution okay that means m1 divided by m1 plus m2 similarly uh, mass fraction or concentration of component 2 is nothing but mass of that component in the solution m2 divided by the total mass of the solution okay m1 and m2 are mass of component 1 and 2 So for a binary uh, system, you can very easily show that z1 uh, plus z2 is equal to one from the above expression. That means z2 is equal to one minus z1. Okay. So if you know the composition of one component, the composition of the other component can be easily obtained. Okay. Now the composition in terms of mole fraction. So in instead of talking about uh, masses, we talk about the number of moles. So mole fraction of component one is nothing but the ratio of number of moles of component one divided by the total number of moles. of component 1 and 2 in the solution okay similarly mole fraction of 2 x2 is given by n2 divided by n1 plus n2 where n1 and n2 are number of moles of components 1 and 2 okay just like uh, the mass fraction uh, it can be very easily shown shown that x1 plus x2 is equal to 1 or x2 is equal to 1 minus x1 
And very uh, another very important property as far as refrigerant absorbent uh, plates are concerned is what is known as miscibility. Okay. And miscibility is an important property and it depends upon the operating conditions. That means under certain operating conditions a refrigerant absorbent plate may not be uh, very highly miscible whereas at other conditions they may be highly miscible. Okay. So, it depends upon the operating conditions. And generally refrigerant absorbent pairs must be completely miscible both in liquid as well as vapor phases. So, that is how you choose the pairs so that uh, they get mixed completely and you get a homogeneous mixer. Now, let us define uh, what is known as an ideal homogeneous binary mixer. Okay. A solution is called as an ideal solution if specific volume of the mixer is equal to the sum of the volume of its constituents. That means, let us take a binary mixer, I take uh, uh, component 1 and component 2, component 1 has a specific volume of uh, V1 and uh, component 2 has specific volume V2 and I mix certain masses of these two components. You will find that the specific volume of the mixer is simply equal to the volumes of its constituents, okay, sum of the volume of its constituents. Okay. No. Then uh, during this mixing process, neither heat is generated nor absorbed. Okay. So, this is another characteristic of uh, ideal solution and the mixer obeys uh, Rawls law in uh, liquid phase and the mixer also obeys Dalton's law in vapor phase. So, these are the four uh, conditions, they are not totally unrelated actually these conditions are related, but uh, these are uh, based on these uh, four uh, points you can say whether the solution behaves as an ideal solution or not. Okay. So, uh, let us look at mathematically what do we mean by this. So, uh, condition 1, condition 1 as I mentioned uh, uh, the solution of the specific volume of the solution should be simply equal to the sum, uh, sum total of the specific volumes of the uh, components. Okay. So, this is the mass fraction of component 1 and this is specific volume of component 1, this is the mass fraction of component 2, this is specific volume of comp uh, component 2. Okay. So, the specific volume of the mixer is simply equal to this, this means the solution neither expands nor contracts, that means there will not be any volume change upon mixing. Okay. So, this is for, for condition 1 and condition 2 the specific enthalpy. Okay. Since, the no heat is released or absorbed it can be very easily shown that the specific enthalpy of the solution is simply equal to the weighted average uh, enthalpies of component 1 and component 2. Okay. Xi 1 and Xi 2 as I said are mass fractions, H 1 and H 2 are the specific enthalpies of component 1 and 2 at that particular temperature and pressure. Okay. So, the same thing can be written in this form okay, because Xi 1, Xi 2 is equal to 1 minus Xi 1. This is the condition, the second condition and what is Raoult's law? Raoult's law says that for an ideal solution the vapor pressure exerted by component 1 is simply equal to the product of its liquid phase mole fraction x 1, x 1 is equal to liquid phase mole fraction. Okay. So, it is a vapor pressure exerted by component 1 is equal to the product of liquid phase mole fraction x 1 into P 1 sat. What is P 1 sat? P 1 sat is nothing but the saturated pressure of uh, the, this uh, component 1 at that particular temperature T. Okay, so, P 1 sat is this. So, the vapor pressure is given uh, for component 1 is given by this, for component 2 is given by this, okay, where x 2 is the liquid phase mole fraction of component 2. So, this is what is known as Raoult's law. Okay. So, if you know the composition uh, composition, and if you also know the saturation properties, you can find out what is the vapor pressures in solution. Okay. What is Dalton's law? If you remember Dalton's law is for the vapor phase and it says that the vapor pressure in vapor phase is equal to the mole fraction of component 1 in vapor phase into the total pressure P total. Similarly, the vapor pressure for component 2 is equal to the product of mole fraction y2 into the total pressure. Okay. This is the Dalton's law. Okay. So, you can easily show that the vapor phase mole fraction y1 and y2 are related by this expression y1 plus y2 is equal to 1 just like your liquid phase mole fraction. So, y2 is y1 minus y1 and the total pressure, total pressure is nothing but the sum total of the pressures exerted by component 1 plus component 2, okay, PV1 plus PV2. Suppose if you have a component uh, which is non-volatile, let us say that component 2 is non-volatile, then Y2 is equal to, it is almost Y2 is equal to 0. That means what you have is only pure vapor, or only volatile uh, component boils off and uh, Y2 is equal to 0, that means Y1 is equal to 1. 
So, in the such case when you are clubbing uh, Raoult's law and uh, Dalton's law, you can very easily show that total pressure exerted is simply equal to vapor, uh, vapor pressure exerted by component 1 which is equal to x1 into p1 sat. Okay. That means again if you know the saturated properties for the volatile component and if you also know the uh, composition then you can easily calculate what is the total pressure exerted. Okay. So, these are the ideal solutions. Obviously, the real solutions uh, are not ideal solutions. A real solution uh, either contracts or expands upon mixing. That means, uh, the specific volume V is not equal to xi1 V1 plus xi2 V2 and either heat is evolved or heat is absorbed upon mixing. That means, the mixing process is exothermic, either exothermic or endothermic. That means, H is not equal to xi1 H1 plus xi2 H2, but it is equal to xi1 H1 plus xi2 H2 plus delta H mix, where delta H mix is called as heat of mixing, which could be positive or negative. So, the difference between uh, ideal and real solutions can be attributed to their deviation from Rawls law. Okay. So, let me show that. So, what I have shown here uh, is uh, the mole fraction of component 2 versus pressure. Okay. When the mole fraction is 1 uh, 0 here that means, you have pure component 1 and here you have component 2. Okay. That is why the pressure here is nothing but the saturation pressure uh, of component 1 and the pr pressure here is the saturation pressure of component 2. Remember that the temperature is constant here and if the solution behaves an ideal uh, solution you have this line because at any point the pressure is simply equal to uh, x1 uh, p1 plus x2 p2. Okay, that is from your Rawls law, but the real solutions will deviate either in a positive manner or in a negative manner. If they deviate from a positive in a positive manner, the actual vapor pressure will be larger than the vapor pressure predicted by Rawls law. Okay, this is what you call as positive deviation and if they deviate in a negative manner, you find that the actual pressure is less than the pressure predicted by the uh, ideal solution. Okay. Uh, that is uh, from the Rawls law. Okay. This you call it as negative uh, deviation from Rawls law. Okay. The same thing you can also show on enthalpy chart. What I have shown here is only for the negative uh, deviation. Okay. So, real solutions with negative deviation because this is what you encounter in uh, vapor absorption refrigerant systems. So, for uh, real solutions with uh, negative deviation, you will find that the delta, delta H mix is negative. Okay. That means, heat is evolved uh, during the mixing process that means this process is exothermic okay. and this straight line gives the enthalpy of an ideal solution and the enthalpy of real solution with negative deviation will be less than uh, this because the delta H mix is negative. Okay. So, as I said if the deviation is positive then at a given temperature and composition vapor pressure exerted is greater than that predicted by Rawls law and heat of mixing is positive that means endothermic for uh, positive deviation it is endothermic for negative deviation it is exothermic. So, the reverse is true if the deviation is negative. Now, let us look at simple vapor absorption refrigerant systems. A simple single stage vapor absorption refrigerant system consists of a solution heat exchanger in addition to the basic components. The solution heat exchanger improves the performance of the system by reducing heat input to the generator and heat rejected at the absorber. That means, the only difference between the earlier basic system and this simple practical system is an addition of one component that is called as solution heat exchanger. So, what we have done in this system is an extra component is added, this is called uh, solution heat exchanger. What is the function of this solution heat exchanger? This solution heat exchanger preheats, okay, preheats the solution that is going to the generator by using the heat of the solution that is coming from the generator. So, you can see that there is a heat exchange between the hot solution coming from the generator and the cold solution that is going to the generator. So, there is a heat exchange as a result Q z reduces this also reduces. Okay. So, that is a function of the uh, solution heat exchanger here. Rest of the components are same. Okay. In fact, this figure is shown as pressure versus uh, temperature. Okay. They have, uh, so, the you can also see the respective pressures and temperatures on this diagram. Okay. This I will explain in detail when we discuss the actual systems. Now, let me quickly look at the refrigerant absorbent combinations. The desirable properties are the refrigerant should exhibit high solubility with solution in the absorber, it should be highly soluble in the absorber 
and the difference in boiling points should be large so that only refrigerant boils in the generator okay so this is another uh, desirable point and heat of mixing should be small okay of course point 1 and 3 are contradictory you cannot have both okay uh, then there should be no crystallization or solidification inside the system we'll see what is crystallization or solidification in the next class okay then the solution should be non corrosive and it should exhibit good transport properties that means the thermal conductivity should be high and viscosity should be low so these are the desirable properties and based on these desirable properties uh, there are two most commonly used refrigerant absorbent pairs they are water lithium bromide for large capacity air conditioning applications and ammonia water uh, for large and small capacity refrigeration applications so we will be discussing these systems in detail in next class, uh, one or two lectures okay and there are also uh, other uh, refrigerant absorbent pairs which are in uh, at research level they are not at commercialized okay so basically the most important pairs as far as uh, the commercialized systems are concerned are water lithium bromide and ammonia water pairs okay now let me quickly summarize what we have learned in this lesson in this lesson uh, basic concepts in absorption refrigerant systems are introduced and simple vapor absorption refrigerant systems are described and expressions for maximum cop of an ideal absorption system is derived and properties of ideal and real solutions are discussed and finally we have listed desirable properties of refrigerant absorbent combinations okay in the next le le lecture i shall uh, discuss uh, uh, lithium bromide water systems okay after that i shall discuss ammonia water systems okay thank you Welcome back. In the last lecture, I introduced vapor absorption refrigeration systems and I mentioned that the two most commonly used refrigerant absorbent pairs are those based on water lithium bromide and ammonia water systems. In the present lecture, I shall discuss uh, the absorption systems based on water and lithium bromide and the specific objectives of this particular lesson are introduce water lithium bromide systems discuss property evaluation with the help of property charts present steady flow analysis of the system discuss typical uh, problems associated with this system and finally describe commercial systems and at the end of this lesson you should be able to explain basic principles of water lithium bromide systems obtain uh, relevant solution properties using property charts evaluate steady state performance of the system describe practical problems and discuss commercial system practices.